basic and fundamental questions about a polymer, given that polymers are big molecules, we ask the question just how big are they? Or in particular, how can we work out how big they are? What sort of experimental techniques are available to us? And how do we describe how big they are? And we talked about different ways which we might describe the size of a molecule. Uh, and we focused in particular on molar masses. But we also said there was a particular problem when we're dealing with polymers, because we're nearly always dealing with mixtures. We don't have lots of molecules all the same size. We have a mixture of molecules of different sizes. So you have to describe that mixture in some way. We describe it in terms of a distribution of molar mass. <coughs> but then we found we had another problem. Because when we think about how we describe amounts of things, we can describe amounts in different ways. We can count things or we can weigh things. And when we describe a distribution of molar mass, uh, we can either describe it in terms of amounts, in terms of numbers, how many molecules we've got, how many moles we've got, anything proportional to that, or in terms of weights, what mass of material we've got, or what weight concentration, anything proportional to that. Is anyone missing a handout at this point? Yes, some people haven't managed. There's still plenty of space. But if we have a mix, if we have a distribution, it's all very well if we can work out the whole distribution. And next Monday, we're going to talk about an experimental method which, in an ideal case at least, will enable us to do that. But often, if we try to do an experiment, we, we just get a value for something. And if we've got a mixture, then what we get is an average. So inevitably, when we deal with polymers, we're going to end up having to deal with averages. And in particular, averages of molar masses is what we're going to talk about today. So let's start, well, just reminding ourselves, it matters. When we're dealing with polymers, size matters. Lots of little things contribute a lot to the number distribution, only a little bit to the weight distribution. One massive thing contributes a lot to the weight distribution, hardly anything to the number distribution. So it matters how we measure things. We're going to see that again when we talk about averages. Let's ask a simple question. If I asked you to work out the average or the mean weight of all the people in this lecture theatre, what are you going to do? How are you going to go about it? We've got a couple of people still arriving. There's handouts at the front here for you. <coughs> and there's still space in the middle. Anyone wants to... Shuffle along and let you in. <coughs> so how are we gonna how, how how would you normally go about working out an average of some of let's say the average weight? What would we do? Some of the Some of the weight over it. So you so you'd add up all of the weights, divide by how many people? Is that right? Is that what we do? Add up all the weights, divide by the number of people. That's better. Yeah, is that what we do? Yeah, that's fair enough. That's what most people would do. But let, let's, let's write that down in a slightly different way. We've still got people trying to find seats here. It's a bit nice to be. Have you got somewhere to sit? Yeah. yeah. People are moving up for you. Good. Okay. Now, of course, we, everyone can be a different weight, but if you remember when we were talking about polymer molecules, actually they can only be certain weights. We talked about this yesterday, that actually they're discrete distributions in the sense that you have uh, multiples of a repeat unit, plus or minus a little bit. But if we round your weights, so we can sort of put you in little classes, then a way of describing what we just said was if we've got a certain number of people, we'll call them N1, who weigh a certain amount, we'll call it M1, and then another number of people, we'll call it N2, who weigh another amount, M2, we can take, multiply the numbers by the masses, so we've got N1, N1, and we've got N2, N2, we add all of those up together, 
That's the same as saying add up all the weights. That's just another way of, write, of saying add up all the weights, isn't it? And if we divide through by n1 plus n2 plus for as many numbers as we've got, that's the same way as saying divide by the total number. So what we just described that we would do, we can if we want, we can write it like this. We can say, say for each possible mass, m, how many have we got of that? Multiply it by the number, add that up for all the possible masses, and then divide by the sum of all the numbers. So that's a way of writing down in a nice compact form what uh, you said you would do if you were going to work out the weight, the average of all the people here. Yeah? Are we happy that that's a, that's a way of describing that? So there's no difficulty in appreciating what that means. Okay? So that, that's a sort of average that we commonly encounter. Because when we look at people and think about averages, we, we tend to see people as individuals, don't we? So we tend to count them. And this, because it involves numbers, we're averaging over the number, we're going to call this a number average. So that's the sort of average when, we, when we're used to counting things and we average, so we might add up all the weights divided by the total number. So, if we're thinking about masses of molecules or molar masses, we can define a number average molar mass just as we've described. It'll be the sum of all of the numbers times the molar masses, which is the same as saying the sum of the, the total mass present divided by the total number present. But if we look at that equation and remember what we've said, we've said we can count things or we can weight things. We've got different ways of describing amount. And so we can take this, an equation of exactly the same form, but wherever we have an n, because we're counting, we can have a w, because we're weighing. It's another way of averaging. And what we then have is a weight average. So to get a weight average, we would do just as we did, but instead of counting how many people we've got, or molecules we've got of a certain molar mass, we'll take the total weight or mass that we have of that particular molar mass, add it up, divide by the total mass that's present. So we've got two averages here, which each can be applied to any distribution that we can talk about. Now, we said yesterday that if we have a weight term, we can always convert to a number term, because actually ni times mi is equal to wi. Or if you have a wi, we can divide by mi to get an ni. So we can express either of these averages, either in terms of numbers or in terms of weights. They're equivalent ways of doing it. So we've got two different averages here. Um, so if we, if, we, if we look at how they relate to each other, this is the one that we normally meet, what we call the number average. And all we've done to get the weight average, in fact, is to multiply every term, top and bottom, by molar mass, m. So th mathematically, this is, like, is what you get if you take that and you multiply every term by m, isn't it? Actually, of course, what you realise then is that if you can do that once, you can do it any number of times. So you can define another average, if you want, where you multiply everything by m again. That's actually got a name. It's called the z average. If you want, you can multiply everything by that again, get a z plus 1 average. You have actually an infinite number of averages, which get more and more weighted by the bigger things. But these are the two that we'll worry about for this course. There are some experimental techniques which will measure a z average. So the z average is important, but you're not going to have to worry about it on this course. You will, if you do a more advanced course. So you're just going to focus on two averages here, the number average and the weight average. But you do need to understand the difference between them, how to calculate each under any given set of circumstances. And you'll also discover there are other averages which don't fit this pattern. Next week you'll meet a viscosity average, which is a little bit different. These averages just depend on the mixture of molecules that we've got. But with, but with certain 
experiments, you might get an average which depends on something else as well. So if we're looking at viscosity, and we'll talk about this next Tuesday, uh, you actually get an average which depends not only on the mixture of molecules, but also on the solvents in which you're studying them. So you get an average which is actually somewhere between these two and depends on the solvent as well as the distribution. But for now we'll focus on averages which just tell us about what distribution we've got. The number and the weight. So let's just see um, how it works. If you remember yesterday we had a little example to see how distributions work where we had a little picture with 15 molecules, you remember? And we worked it through to see what the number distribution looked like and the weight distribution looked like. So now I'm going to take the same data, so this starts out where we finished off yesterday. We're going to say, can we calculate the number average and the weight average molar mass for that same sample that corresponded to those same distributions? Uh, so we've got some molar masses. Remember we had, it was very, kept it nice and simple, we had 100, 200, 200, 400, 500, and the numbers of molecules we had, it was a very small sample, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. And we worked out yesterday that the corresponding weight terms were 500, 800, 900, 800, 500. So, we can do a few things. Now, now we know what we need to get those averages. Let's think about the number average first. Um, on the, we want some sum of Ni's or Mi's, so we can express that as sum of Wi's on the top. We want the sum of Ni's on the bottom. Well, the sum of the Ni's, that's the number of molecules we've got in this nice simple case, that's just 15. And the sum of the Wi's in comparable terms, if we add up 500 plus 800 plus 900 plus 800 plus 500, if I've done my sums right, it should come out at about uh, 3,500. So if we take 3,500 and divide by 15, we come up with our number average molar mass, 233 <coughs> in our units. Remember the grams per mole. Now, if we want the weight average molar mass, we need to do a little bit more because we've got what we want on the bottom here, but we need our weights multiplied by a molar mass. We're going to take this weight multiplied by 100, that's going to be difficult, 100 times 500. 100 times 500. <laughs> About 50,000, something like that. Okay, 200 times 800. 800. So we've got 160,000. Uh, 300 times 900, 270,000. 400 times 800, 320,000. 500 times 500, 250,000. Add those all up. We've got just over a million, 1.05 million. So that's what we then want to take to divide by the sum of all of the weight terms, which was 35,000, if you remember. So our weight average is 300 grams per mole. Actually, we could have worked that out. We wouldn't need, didn't need to do the calculation in this nice, simple case. If we look at the weight distribution that you worked out, we saw that it was perfectly symmetrical. 500, 800, 900, 800, 500, and these are equally spaced. Therefore, do we know that the average of the weight distribution is going to be right in the middle? It's going to be 300. So we didn't actually have to do the calculation in this case. We could just look at the data, and immediately we realized the weight average is nice and symmetrical. It's right in the middle. But of course, the number average will be lower than that. Remember, the number distribution is skewed towards the lower molar mass because we've got more molecules in that distribution. <coughs> And you'll notice something, the weight average is a bigger number than the number average. It has to be. <laughs> or at least the same. Well, where, what would it mean if those averages were exactly the same? What would be that tell us about our sample? There's only one type. Say again? There's only one type. Yeah, it means it's a perfectly uniform sample. All the molecules are identical. If we have any mixture at all, then those averages will be different. But if, it's, if they're all very close to each other, they won't be very different. But if they're exactly the same as each other, we only have one size. It's a uniform polymer. All the molecules are exactly the same size. So say we very rarely encounter that with polymers. 
You might, that way you might would be if you take a protein and purify it very carefully. Um, or if you spend a few months making a very well-defined dendroma, you can get something perfect, all the sample one size. But usually, there is a mixture. There are types of polymerization, you may learn a bit about them later in the course, which will give you a, what we call a very narrow distribution. But there's still a bit of a mixture. Um, I'd use the term uniform here. You'll also come across the term monodisperse, which originally sort of meant the same thing, but in practice it tends to apply to polymers which have got a very narrow distribution, for which there's not much of a mixture. Uh, in other words, the best we can achieve uh, by the polymerization methods that are available to us. But in gen so in general, we'll normally deal with mixtures. If we're dealing with a mixture, Mn, the number average, will always be less than Mw. So if you're doing, if you're in an exam, and you're doing some calculations, and you're calculating Mn and Nw, and being good uh, chemist by now, you should know that in an exam you always think about whether your answers are reasonable, you check what answers you've got, and if you discover that you've calculated an Mn that's bigger than an Nw, you know you've made a mistake. It has to be wrong. So you go back and check what you've done wrong. It's one of the little simple things you can check in an exam. Now, what happens if, now, if they are normally different, what happens if we ratio one to the other? Nw to Mn. Now, we said if, 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 if the polymer was perfectly uniform, if we only had one type of molecule in there, then those numbers would be the same. Now, if our distribution is very narrow, that means we only have little differences in the size of the molecules. So the molecules are all nearly the same. Then Mn will be very close to Nw, so the ratio will be very close to 1. If we have a mixture where we've got some very small ones and some really enormous ones, a very broad distribution, then the number average will be very different to the weight average. So that ratio will be much larger than one. So if we take that ratio, we're, we're finding something about what we call polydispersity. It's the breadth of the distribution, strictly in this case the breadth of the number distribution, the breadth of the weight distribution, is expressed as mz, the z average, divided by the weight average. So this, if we calculate a couple of averages, it tells us something about the distribution. Is it narrow? Is it broad? But not everything. Because, of course, I don't have a... You can imagine a distribution like that, which is a bimodal distribution, and a distribution like that, which is a unimodal distribution, which would have exactly the same number and weight averages. Which is why we really want to know about the shape of the distribution, not just averages. Because those two distributions could behave very differently if you're, doing, if you're processing the polymer and wanting to use it in some way. Okay, so let's have another look at another example. If you go back to previous exam papers for courses like this, you'll see it's a sort of thing we like to ask, a nice little test of how good you are and whether you understand things. So a very simple example, if we've got three polymer samples, monodisperse, we'll assume they're effectively uniform, uh, we'll call them A, B and C, they've got molar masses of 100,000, 200,000 and 300,000 grams per mole. Uh, and so what we're going to say is we're going to take these three different samples, we're going to mix them together and then we're going to work out what the average molar masses are for our mixture. Now remember, in anything like this, it matters how we work out our amounts. Remember, we can always count things or weigh things. We may mix in terms of moles, or we may mix in terms of masses. So with a question like this, always look carefully to check how you're mixing things. And in this case, it says very clearly we're mixing them in equal proportions by weight. By weight. It might have said by mole, in which case you'd have to take that into account when you do your sums. But in this case, it's by weight, to make it nice, simple, it's e equal proportions. In other words, the ratio is one to one to one of A to B to C by weight. Of course, there are different numbers of moles there, because they're different sizes. 
So if you were mixing them in equal proportions by mole, you'd have different weights of each polymer. That's why it's important to know how you're measuring a mass. And let's have a look at what we've got. We've got three polymers, A, B, C, 100,000, 200,000, 300,000, grams per mole molar mass. We're going to mix in them by weight. When we start out, it's the ratio that's important. It doesn't matter what numbers you put in, as long as you're then self-consistent in what you do thereafter. So we're mixing by weight, and it's one to one to one by weight. So the simplest thing is simply to say we've got one lot of A, one gram, one kilogram, one whatever, doesn't matter, of A, the same amount of B, the same amount of C. And if we put ones in there and add them all up, that means all together we've got three, whatever it is. We could, if we want, I've used weight fractions and said 0 0.33, 0 0.33, 0 0.33, 0 0.33. You're going to put 100, 100, 100. It doesn't matter. As long as you work things through self consistently, you'll get the same answers because you're always dividing two by some. Now, we want some numbers now. We've got our weights, so we're going to have to work out some equivalent number terms. We're going to take whatever weight we've got and divide by the molar mass. <coughs> So if we're working it through saying that we've got one whatever gram or whatever of each, then the appropriate number term would be one divided by one times 10 to the five. Well, that's an easy sum for us all. One times 10 to the minus five. One divided by two times 10 to the five. So that's five times 10 to the minus six. One divided by three times 10 to the five. So that's 3.3 or thereabout times 10 to the minus six. And if we add up all of those numbers, if I've done my science right, someone I want to check. I don't mind if I've got it wrong. Tell me if I've got it wrong. Don't just take my word for anything. Always check things for yourself. Mistakes creep in. 1.83 times 10 to the minus 5. So now we've got the information we need to calculate the number average. So we've got all of the weights, and we've got all of the numbers. Okay, so the sum of the weight terms is 3, the sum of the number terms is 1.83 times 10 minus 5, divide by 1 by the other, our number average molar mass, 1.64 times 10 to the 5, 164,000 grams per mole. <coughs> but for our weight average, remember we need this WIMI term, so we need to do a few more sums, okay? But it's not going to be very difficult, it's not very difficult at all. In this case, we've made it really simple for ourselves, because we've just got one six, we're going to multiply that by that, that by that, that by that, and as they're all ones, you can do that very quickly, it's 100,000, 200,000, 300,000. <laughs> Add them all up, we have 600,000, 6 times 10 to the 5. So now we have all the information we need to calculate the weight average. 6 times the pi divided by 3, 200,000 grams per mole. Again, actually in this case, because it's a very simple set of numbers, we didn't actually need to do that. We could work out, we could tell what the weight average is just by looking at the data. Because we've got uh, equal amounts and they're equally spaced. So it's going to be right in the middle. Uh, 200,000. We didn't need to do the sum there, but it's a good idea to do it just to check. And in an exam, you would get a slightly more complicated problem than this, which wouldn't be usually quite so easy to check. But the po but you still have a, you know, if you look at the distribution, if you look what you've got, you know what sort of answer to expect. You know roughly where it's going to come. If you came up with an answer of 10 million, you would know you'd got it wrong. It, can't, it couldn't possibly be with the distribution you've got there. Because yeah? the average is, is going to be somewhere in the middle. You know, if it's a symmetrical distribution, it'll be right in the middle for the weight distribution. If it's a bit distorted, then that's going to push the average. But you can get a pretty good idea of roughly where it's going to be. So again, when you're in an exam condition, always think of the little things you can check that you've got things right. Because you do make mistakes in exams. And a lot of them are easily correctable mistakes. Okay, so what we've done is we've talked about um, 
two different kinds of average. We mentioned there are others, but there are two that we're going to focus on, the number average, the weight average. We immediately see that we get different numbers if we have a mixture. If the numbers are the same, it means we have all exactly the same size molecules. The ratio of those two numbers tells us something about the breadth of the distribution. So what I want to do now is to talk a little bit about how we might actually determine some of these things. We talked about distributions. We said we can express things as number distributions or as weight distributions. We've talked about averages. We defined a number average and a weight average. But, you know, what experimental techniques might we use to actually get some of this information? Now, we've got a few possibilities here. And, again, let's just think about what sort of information we can get. Each, each experiment will give us certain things, not other things. So first of all, we might say, okay, we've got a polymer, and if it's not too big, um, how are we going to work out how big it is? Well, supposing, um, supposing we have something specific on the end, something, you know, the end group is, the end is often a bit different to the middle. So if we can identify and quantify the end groups, and, ident and quantify how many main chain units we've got, uh, then we should be able to ratio that in some way to work out the length of the chain. And sometimes you can do that with NMR, for example. If you've got an NMR signal, uh, uh, but associated with the end group, an NMR signal associated with something in the repeat unit. If you do your NMR experiment quantitatively, remembering that often NMR experiments are done for speed, uh, and consequently the peak sizes can be distorted and the integrals are incorrect. So if you really want good data, you have to make sure the experiment is done in the way to get quantitative data but uh, particularly if you deal with carbon NMR. But uh, if you can identify an end group and, a, and, a, and a, um, a main chain thing and you integrate appropriately, then that's one way of calculating uh, a molar mass. And if you think about it, what we've got is a certain number of ends. What we're effectively doing here is counting uh, the molecules in a mass at certain weight of sample. We know what mass of sample we've got. Um, we're effectively counting molecules, uh, so uh, the uh -oh. at the moment it's standby. <laughs> Be prepared to evacuate. If it goes continuous, we evacuate. Yes, the environment. Let's see if we can wish to we're doing end group analysis, we're effectively counting molecules. So the average you'll get will be a number average. This is a bit much, isn't it? Okay, look, let's, let's... There are other techniques. Membrane osmometry is a colligative property. It'll give you a number average. There's another technique which is light scattering. That will give you a weight average. So these are different techniques will give different averages. We're going to talk next Tuesday about dilute solution viscometry. It enables you to calculate something called an intrinsic viscosity, which uh, relates to uh, an average all of its own, which is the viscosity average. And we'll talk about that. But next Monday, we'll focus on a Experiment, which enables us to actually get information about the whole distribution. I think let's leave it at that. I'll see you on Monday. <laughs>